Hi. In the last few classes and workshops, we've learned about periodic trends. And now as we move to solving problems with periodic trends, let's review what those components are. Periodic trends are based on the extended Bohr model. And the extended Bohr model has three equations. The first is that the effective nuclear charge Z is equal to Z, the number of protons, minus the shielding. The size of the atom R is equal to A0 N squared over Z effective, where N is the principal quantum number. The total energy is minus RH Z effective squared over N squared. And these relations are very often best used as proportionalities. R is proportional to N squared over Z effective. And E total is proportional to Z effective squared over N squared. And the energies that we measure are mainly of two kinds. First is the ionization energy. The ionization energy is the minimum energy of a photon which when absorbed by an atom releases a free electron. And there is another type of energy. When an atom encounters a free electron, it can absorb the free electron. The atom gains a minus charge. The free electron goes down in energy. When it goes down in energy, a photon is released. And the electron affinity, Ea, is the smallest amount of energy that can be released. And we can use these, uh, these, uh, these the notions from extended, uh, the extended Bohr model to look at the S and P block. So here is the S and P block. of the periodic table. And going left to right, the dominant fe feature is imperfect shielding, which causes Z effective to increase. And as Z effective increases, it's in the denominator here. So a larger Z effective means that R gets smaller. So R is getting smaller. And Z effective is in the numerator here. So when Z effective increases, E total, the magnitude of E total is increasing. When we go down in, in the periodic table, don't go down a column, the dominant factor is not Z effective, it's the fact that N has changed. N is getting larger as we go down in the periodic table. And so when we look at that, we see that uh, when N increases, N is increasing here. So there's an increase of N here. Now, that's in the numerator. So when N increases, R increases. And When n increases, we see that it is in the denominator here. So as n is getting larger, e total is getting smaller. The magnitude of e total is getting smaller. And these are the general trends. But there are exceptions, and they are very important. And there are three main exceptions. The first, we'll look here. Here is the total energy, which is equal to zero. At, at the horizon, we'll have a 1s, a 2s, 2p, I'll put a 3s, and we'll consider first neon. Neon is the 10th element. It has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 10 electrons. So when we fill the diagram with 10 electrons by the alpha principle, we get this. And we see that if a free electron, which starts off at, the, uh, at e, e t equals zero, were to get absorbed by the atom and get, and get placed into it, it gets placed into a very high energy 3s orbital. And that means that's a small energy gap, and that means that the Ea for neon is small. 
And in exactly the same way, we can look at <coughs> the next element of the periodic table, which is sodium. Sodium is 11, 11 uh, electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. It's the 11th element. So the 11th electron goes here in 3s. It's a very high energy electron. It's not going to take much energy light to release that electron to make it free. And that means that sodium has a, s the IE of sodium is small. This is the filled shell effect. And in just a similar way, we can look at other effects. So now we'll, we'll remove some electrons. And instead of neon, we're going to look at beryllium, which is the fourth element of the periodic table. It's 1s2, 2s2. So here's four electrons. And now, again, if we have a free electron that's up here, it can no longer enter the 2s. It's all filled. It has to enter the higher energy subshell, which means that relatively low energy light is going to be given off which means that beryllium has a small Ea. And similarly, we could look at the next element in the periodic table, boron, which has one more electron. If light were to come in and release that electron, it doesn't have far to travel. And that means boron has a small Ie. And this is the filled subshell. This is connected to the filled subshell. And the last main exception to the general trends is for the half shell. A good example of a half shell will be nitrogen, which is the seventh element of the periodic table. By Hund's rule, the three electrons go like this, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And so there's a free electron. If it goes down here, it has to enter an orbital where there are already electrons. And electrons have negative charge, they repel each other. That means that it uh, is not energetically favorable for it to be accepted, which means its Ea is small. And similarly, we can look at the next element in the periodic table, oxygen, where this is now the eighth electron, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. And now, if light were to be received, that last electron, which is feeling all that electron repulsion, will be easily taken out to become a free electron, and that means its IE is small. And this is the ha filled half shell. The three exceptions are the filled shell, the filled subshell, and the filled half shell. And the last important idea that we need as we go to general problems comes from the first equation, Z effective equals Z minus S. Let's compare two atoms. If the two atoms have, if they have the same number of electrons, then shielding will be similar. Shielding is caused by electrons, shielding others. They're the same number, it's around the same amount of shielding. And that means that Z effective is no longer controlled by this S. Z effective is controlled by Z. And we have a parallel effect if we have not the same number of electrons, but we have the same number of protons. Well, we have the same number of protons. Z will not just be similar, Z will be the same. They have the same number of protons, which means Z doesn't affect Z effective. The only thing that controls Z effective is S. And that's the last main component that we need to think about as we move to the problems, which we'll start uh, solving next time. The general trends, the special exceptions, and the rules when we have the same number of electrons and the same number of protons.